hope for you.
Hello, my friend. Welcome to Tuesdays with the Ambassador of Hope. This is episode number 69, 70 something. But please forgive me. Um, as you can tell, um, I'm not live as in live, live, live because right this moment I'm flying out of Ghana. But I just felt that there was something that I needed to share with you. So welcome again, all our regular family, all of you. I wish I could mention your name, but you know something? Stay put because it's going to be amazing. A few weeks ago, I taught a message on free to be me. It wasn't streamed live, but I just felt that there was something in it to help you. So please share, share right now. Please pick up your tablet and share. I'm going to play it in the next few minutes. And then what I want you to do is um, to give me a feedback. Ask questions. Soon as I land, I'm going to come back to you and then we're going to have a conversation. It's just about 35, 40 minutes. So don't go away. It's going to be amazing. Today, you are going to be set free. Your mind is going to be set free. Your spirit is going to be set free. You are going to be yourself. Some of you have lived your life for others. I don't want you to do that. I want you to be free to be yourself, to bring out the full expression of everything that God has made you. So whatever you do, don't go away. Please share, 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 share. And as I, as I speak, give me a feedback. Just let me know what's going to happen, what, how you feel, and then I'll come back to you. Is that okay? God bless you. Now let's roll. What's our word for 2022? I've already started. Is it? What is what? How many of you feel that your life is coming back into order? In one way or the other, finance, relationship, personal life, sleeping, something. <laughs> Anybody coming into order? That is what God gave to us. First Corinthians chapter 4, 14, verse 44 said, Let everything, all things be done decently and in order. Maybe, maybe one of the years, God should tell us that the year is the season of decency. Sense. Anytime you are in hospital with a very serious situation and it demands surgery, the, the, the surgeon, the doctor, whoever, specialist, consultant, whatever their names are, will put on some scrubs. You agree with me? And I think then they will go and do surgery. And this morning I'm, I have scrubs. <laughs> I have scrubs for us to, you know, work because we are going to work a little bit. The unfortunate situation is I won't have a lot of time for this, but Pastor Kwame will take over later. But one of the most pursued surgeries in, in the world today that make, is making billions in the industry is cosmetic surgery. Don't look at anybody. Don't, 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 don't. And many times it is done by people to change their appearance. That is why today you need all the graces of God. God's grace is not one different. Multifaceted grace. You need graces to marry. Because who you see may not be what you are getting. Anybody knows what I'm talking about? For the, for the life of me, how can anybody grow eyelashes in two minutes? Some of us have been doing this thing for 65 years. We still can't get height. Because you never know. And the procedure I'm going to do today is rather the opposite of cosmetic surgery. Because I want to strip you of all the false layers. And in the end, hopefully, I'll be able to introduce yourself to yourself. Because I realize that human behavior is very complex. And people don't, well, the, the professor says highly, <laughs> Dr. Kwame, you, you better be steady. <laughs> You know, people don't behave just because of behavior. There are triggers. There are things in their life that cause these behaviors. And sometimes people are frustrated. People are fearful. People feel defeated. Because they are hiding behind layers of things that are not them. And the truth is that it is very, very hard not to be you. Anytime you are stopped by law enforcement, I don't know for what reason, stopped by law enforcement, one of the first things that the law enforcement officer will ask you is, may I see your ID? Driver's like, true or false? Why is that? Because they want to make sure that you are who you say you are. And I want to submit to all of you this morning that there is no greater freedom than the freedom of being yourself. Our Lord Jesus Christ came preaching. It was a two-pronged two attack. Number one, 
He came preaching the kingdom. He said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is here. His first message that he preached in the temple in Luke chapter 44, he said, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me because he has anointed me too. And began, and one, the end is to bring liberty. The sad situation is that there are people walking around, they are free, but they are not free. They are liberated, walking about like the, the children of Israel, but they are not free. And so this morning, in a few minutes, let me address what I've, I've entitled, Free to be me. That is my burden. I want you to be free to be yourself. Because it's always hard. The reason why you are always running is you fear people will, will discover you. Can you imagine coming to your father for a blessing and the father says, your clothing and your skin is another type, but your voice too belongs to somebody else. Could it be that some prayers are not being answered by God because he's not sure who you are? There was a woman who was sick, about to die, was in the hospital and prayed and the Lord gave her a promise that you won't die, you will live so many more years. She was so excited, she got healed. And out of the excitement, she went to do some cosmetic surgery, you know, all these things. And after she finished, she came out of the salon, was crossing the road and got hit by a car. And she died. She went to heaven and was very angry with God. She said, but you promised me 50 more years. And the Lord said, who are you? See, the Lord couldn't remember because he promised a particular individual. <laughs> In John chapter 13, the first five verses, the Bible says that before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world. He loved them to the end. That is leadership. He loved them to the end. Let's go ahead. And supper being ended, the, the devil, having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from the supper, lay aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself. And after that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel with which he was girded. Now look at the scene. Jesus, by whose agency the whole world is created, the Son of God, sinless, is with his 12 disciples, the ones we call his apprentices. And they go into a house, and in those days it was common courtesy for the host to wash the feet of visitors. Because it was a very dusty terrain. And um, they, didn't have to work, they, didn't, they didn't have air conditioners and all those things. So it was very dusty. So whenever anybody came to your house, the first thing you do was to offer them water for their feet, to wash their feet. And especially when the, when the person who is coming to you is in a higher rank in society, it becomes another matter. And for a rabbi to come into your home, you the host, you were bound to do the washing of feet. That is why at one point when there were feet that, there were hands that would not wash and lips that would kiss feet. Jesus said to them that, leave the woman alone. The things that you should have done, you didn't, you didn't give me oil to anoint my head, you didn't wash my feet. The woman has washed my feet with, with her tears and, and cleaned clean with her hair. That is why, you see, when, when the rabbi came into the house, the first thing that should have done was water for then they would kiss his ring or his feet, his, his, his whatever. That is why what Judas did was so terrible. Because that kiss was telling everyone that I honor you as my leader, my master, but I'm still going to betray you. And because nobody was going to do that, Jesus has a way of shocking us into wisdom. He waited till everybody was okay. They were relaxed. They had eaten. Then he gets up. And I'm sure they were thinking he was going to say one of his wonderful stories. Then suddenly he begins to undress himself. We saw that in verse number four. He laid aside his garment because everybody is identified by what you wear. Referees are identified. Nurses are identified by what they wear. You see it. And Jesus lays aside his garments. He laid aside. He's undressing himself in the presence of his disciples. 
Now imagine their shock, their consternation. What exactly is he doing? Undressing? Yes. Why? Why would he do this? Because he was very secure in himself. It takes a very secure person to undress before others. And how could Jesus do this? And I'll give you the answer, three things at the end of this message. But for a tester, Jesus was secure in himself. One of the greatest battles, and that is what I'm dealing with today, that people are dealing with, is the battle of insecurity. Many people are not happy. Many people's destinies have been stunted. The root of many unpleasant behaviors can be traced to this thing called insecurity. It's so sad that the people that should be relaxed and the coolest are the most agitated. I'm talking about Christians. We are so stressed. Some of you are so stressed. So you, you, you are so tight that we could play you for a, a guitar. You are timid. You can't stand tall. You can't look at people in the eye. You can't deal straight with people because of insecurity. And insecurity spawns many children. Like I told you this, just surface. The real teacher will come and do the thing later. He has about 20 points. And I'll be writing my notes. So how do you, how does insecurity manifest? A few things. Then I'll step out of your way. The first thing is jealousy. The green-eyed monster. Jealousy, the displeasure at the blessing of another person. You see, when you are insecure in yourself, if you're not very, well, when you are insecure, you can be jealous about somebody that you have more than. So sad. Many are jealous about people that don't have what you have. Because you are insecure. So if somebody is a little bit like this, meanwhile you are like that and you can handle it. Can you imagine, can you imagine the brothers of Joseph? I go back in hindsight and I look at the nomenclature of the 12 tribes of Israel. Upon whom the 12 foundations may be laid in future. I looked and I read Rubens, I looked at all oh, and I didn't see Joseph. There's no tribe of Joseph. And yet these people whose names shall be there eternally are killing somebody whose name is not there. You have longevity, he doesn't. You have legacy, he doesn't. And you are busy killing him. So Reuben, you didn't hear that you are the firstborn, the excellence of might, the dignity, and you shall inherit everything from your father. And you are busy trying to kill somebody who had nothing? Exactly what is wrong with you? Levi. Levi, so you don't know that Moses is resident on the inside of you? The one that will redeem Israel out of Egyptian captivity? The one through whom all the priesthood lines will come? Levi. You are the leader of the priesthood. What is happening to you? My God. Do I have to talk to you about Judah? Out of whom the scepter of righteousness shall come. The one that your brothers will praise. You are busy killing Joseph? Benjamin. Kings will come out of you. You are busy killing. Jealousy. Jealousy destroys. When you are insecure. And you are rotted, they will get quiet. Let me tell you, jealousy is one of the most dangerous diseases and manifestations of insecurity. When you are insecure, you can easily be jealous about something you have no jealousy. And sometimes you don't know that the one you are jealous about, they are admiring you. <laughs> let, me, let me run. I told you I'm not going very deep. Number two, manifest unhealthy competition. It's a friend to jealousy. This one needs no in-depth explanation. One reason why a lot of people overextend themselves is because of this, so that they can measure up. So we dress to tell lies. We want titles. 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 
Titles that even boxers don't need. There are people you dare not call them, you dare not call them not by their title. Most Reverend Professor Dr. al was well, is like <laughs> titles. For some is acquisitions. We must get this. Security. Unhealthy competition. At a point, even in our house here, Pastor Kwame, I realized that people were trying to outdo each other at places they held their weddings. I got tired. They had a beautiful sanctuary like this that people would die for. They want a garden somewhere, somewhere. They are charging them 20000 of money you don't have. You don't have. That's present tense. You don't have. So when this one heard that this one did the hairs there, no, I must get another one. What is wrong with you? That money could have been used for something. Lay it in an account and wait till you are 60 and see what it will do for you. Unhealthy competition is here in this house. How high is her st- uh, stiletto, whatever? Six inches. I need six and a half inches. Meanwhile, you are seven foot tall. Comparison is the death of happiness. I kid you not. This is the death of happiness. Second Corinthians chapter number 10 and verse number 12. Paul the apostle said that we dare not class ourselves or compare ourselves to those who commend themselves for they measuring themselves by themselves compare, and comparing themselves amongst themselves are not wise. Comparison. Number three is antagonism and cynicism. Sometimes people become antagonistic and cynic, cynical because of insecurity. It's there. And what they do is that they try to look tall by bringing people down. Listen, anytime you cut somebody down, you only cut them down to your size. It's very difficult to keep people down, I'm telling you. It's easier to lift people down to keep people down. Because when you are keeping people down, you have to be strong and try to keep them down. Because you'll be struggling to get up and you are struggling. You are, you are breaking sweat and must keep them. Also, all of you stay down. But when you are bringing people up, it's just let's all go up together. Church, let's all go up together. Because nobody has to pay for anybody to be tall. That, ladies and gentlemen, is ministry. You bring people up. The fourth manifestation, I like that, amen, thank you. The fourth thing about manifest is that those people are never happy with themselves. And how can you be happy for somebody when you yourself, you are not happy with yourself? Because insecure people, they tend to look down on themselves all the time. You tell your sister, you look nice. Uh, huh? The way they, they it, it can even roll their eyes and the, the thing will get stuck. <laughs> then it's there. People compliment you and say, you sing nice. Oh, sister, you really bless. It's not me, it's the Lord. When did the Lord sing here? When did the Lord sing? I hope I'm teaching you. This is church. When the Lord didn't sing, you sang. So be happy. Me, when people say, I, I'm good, I like it. Because when they say I'm not good, I'm not going to like it. So when I'm good, I like it. So when people say, well, you are going to say, say it again. <laughs> By God's grace. But you, you, know, you know what I mean. People are never happy with themselves. Listen, don't insult your maker. God did not make a mistake in making you who you are. God didn't wake up in the morning and begin to figure out, um, how can I make... No, before your father met your mother, he got you figured out. Psalm 139. Let's do this in the New Living Translation, verse 13 and 16, if you got it for me. He says that you made all the delicate inner parts of my body. You knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. I like that. You are, you are, you are wonderfully complex. Can you imagine? Your workmanship is marvelous. How well I know it. The old says, and my soul knows very well. You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion. As I was woven together in the dark of the womb. Look at this description. You saw me before I was born. Even every day of my life was recorded in your book. What entity on earth has this thing ever been said about them? Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. Which means, listen, before my father said to my mom, I, w- I want to marry you, and my mom said yes, or maybe, or whatever, none of the above, he had me figured. 
So wake up in the morning and look at yourself in the mirror and like what you are seeing. Un insecure people always want to be like somebody else. I want to be like Beyonce. Live on. Michael Jackson, he lost his nose. <laughs> Listen, let me tell you something. <laughs> everybody looks normal until you get to know them. Then you discover that everybody is weird. I wanted to hear that is true. Look, don't look at me that in that kind of tone of voice. We are okay. We are listen. We, 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 no, nobody's okay. Everybody's weird. You try living with them and see. Hmm. You see, that is one reason why a lot of people try to validate themselves by their performance. You throw parties for people who can even stand you. Come and drink your drink, eat your food, soil your carpet and go. And they still don't like you. Because you are validating yourself by performance. Please hear me. God's love and God's approval are not based on your performance or achievement. In this kingdom, there's nothing like achievement. It's everything like receivement. And what do you have that was not given to you? You received it. Listen, let me tell you something about Jesus. In Luke chapter 3 verse 21. Jesus was being baptized in the Jordan. And in the, the Jordan, the Bible says that all the people were baptized. When Jesus also was baptized, and when he prayed, the heavens were open. Now look at what happened. Now, how many of you know that by then he hadn't done any miracle? He hadn't started ministry. He hadn't preached yet. No, no reason. He says, and the Holy Spirit descended boldly on him like a dove upon him. And the voice came up and said, You are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. He hadn't performed, and yet Father says, I am pleased with you. Please listen to me. It's not what you do that makes God pleased with you. It's who you are. Accept it. Oh, you didn't hear me. Let me run. The fifth one is they strive for perfection. What a waste of time. You know, apart from God and me, there's no one perfect. Perfection is a waste of time. Mind, listen, there's a difference between excellence and perfection. There must be a relentless pursuit for excellence, becoming better than what you are. But don't have mindless pursuit of perfection. It won't happen. Because on this side of heaven, you don't attain perfection. One of the things I've noticed about perfectionists is that they make life difficult for all they deal with. I'm not going into detail. So what are some of the things that fuel people's insecurities? Very quickly. I hope you are learning this morning. What are some of the things that fuel people's insecurities? Because there are many factors there. Number one is public opinion. Too many people are living as captives to what people think about them. Listen, opinions are like armpits. Everybody has two. Everybody will have an opinion about you. This one has this one, so two. It's armpits. So please stop overdressing. And go back to constantly check on your Facebook status and photos to see who liked it. The fact that they like that doesn't mean they like you. There are things on Facebook I don't like reacted. You are reacting to what? Reacted. As if I'm a, a, a chemical equation. No. You think everybody, listen, go and ask that mosquito who came back telling mommy, I went out to drink people's blood, people were clapping for me. Listen, if you will really want to walk in this world freely and liberated, understand that human opinion is fickle. The same voices that said Hosanna on a Wednesday were the same voices that said crucify him on a Friday. The same voice, that's what the Bible says, that Jesus did not give himself to man, for he knew what was in man, and he did not know that anyone should test for man, for he knew all things. Paul the apostle gets beaten by a snake, they say he's a murderer. Does he say anything? No. Because he knew they were going to change. He shook the thing. They watched him. He didn't die. They said he's a god. The same people who say you are deputy Jesus. By tomorrow they are calling you deputy devil. So learn that. I'm, I hope I'm helping somebody. Yes. Learn that. You are, you are trying too hard and it doesn't look good on you. What people think about you is important. But it's not as important as what God thinks about you. N number two is personal appearance. Personal appearance. You see, the world has it, like I said in the beginning, that beauty must be in a particular way. Your body shape, your color, 
your height, and you are investing in a lot of things that is eating your future. <laughs> the things I want to say here, <laughs> it's too early in the morning. Wrong investment. Didn't you? Well, I think I can use scriptures to talk about that, can't I? Didn't the scripture say that can an Ethiopia change his color? Ethiopian in those is, is Nubian, black person. Not making too much investment to maintain that thing. Why do you want to be white? It doesn't have to be white to be right. Be yourself. <laughs> Just be yourself. Amen. Freedom comes when you accept that people come in shapes and sizes and colors. By all means, look after your body. By all means, look after your body. By all means, watch your weight. It's very important. But be happy in who God has made you. There are some people, listen, they, 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 they even drink water and they put on weight. There are others, they eat and eat and eat and they are disgustingly slim. You are very annoying. You are very, very annoying. You are the people we have to pray against. What is wrong with you? Why do you put pressure on us like that? They eat everything. Like Pastor Kwame, you know, like everything. Like, what is wrong with him? Anytime I see him, I look at him too. <laughs> and please, I'm begging you, listen. Can we all be respectful and sensitive to people? Yes. Let's be sensitive to people. Amen? I know you can go on a diet for seven days and lose 80 pounds. There are people who go on diet and they put on weight. Please, don't put pressure on people. People are facing things already. Let's be sensitive. It's not your business. You are not the deputy creator. Let people be. The third thing that drives that thing is your environment. That is your background where you have spent a lot of your time. Like your childhood. The schools that you went to. The church that you go to. Listen, there are people that speak and I know what church they belong to. Oh yeah. I know some of you know. So you meet people and you talk and say, do you go to all nations? Say, so how do you know? Say, the way you are talking. Environment. Environment. Your environment is very important. I gave this analog analogy the other time. G give me this bottle of water. Water is water, isn't it? Water is water. I gave it, some, I think, Ghana some years back. And I, I bought, somebody bought me a bottle of water. Let's say for like in Ghana currency, like CDs, two CDs, water. Then I went out for lunch in the afternoon at a very top hotel with mommy and some of the, our old people here in Ghana. And the same water <laughs> that I bought in the supermarket in my neighborhood for two CDs, that same place, you know in those old places they don't call food food. Like you want chicken, they say roasted chicken with a history. Chicken out to Bombay. It's like they, they add all kinds of. It's like, what is wrong with these people? And then they put. Do, do you see rich people's food? Like, you want to kill me? Small, Kobe. I can use this money for something else. Like, like. And then they, 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 they design things on. Like, uh, and I can't lick the plate. I can't lick this thing. I can't lick the God for. Anybody knows what I'm talking about? Am I teaching you this morning? It's like, what is wrong with these people? So when people are inviting me to those places, I make sure I eat before I go. I eat before I go. Because I have to eat some and leave some. I mean, can, can, you are expected also to leave some in the plate to look like a gentleman. What kind of living hell is this? I must have been the same bottle of two cities. In that restaurant, it was 12 cities. What made the difference? The environment. That is why you must be very careful the places you go to. I'm, I kid you not, there are places that you, you will become, your environment will affect you before you affect, you, you affect your environment. Come on, Gideon. It will. You've got to understand that. The places that you hang, that is why people's backgrounds are very important. Because they will tell, the counselors will tell you that they will begin to, a little bit about your history. They want to know where you are coming from so we can determine where you are going to. That is why God asked Hagar when he met her on the world, Hagar, slave of Abraham, where are you coming from and where are, where are you going to? You can't hide your past. 
Because it informs your present and helps you where you are going to. So it's very important, ladies and gentlemen, there are environments that can attack your self-esteem. There are environments that can kill you. There are environments that you go to and you don't feel like a human being. Listen, God gave you two feet. Move. Move. I'm not talking about your marriage yet, but move. Put distance between you. There are some friends, every time you are amongst them, you go home and you feel like less than yourself. You are hanging out among them. Everybody uh, asks for me and my husband, and me and my husband, and me and my, and you have no husband, so you can't even talk. You go home and you are crying in your car. Listen, leave. They are not sensitive. They know you don't have a baby yet, and every everything they tell, and my baby so, and my, and you are sitting there, and they are slapping you every morning. God gave you two feet and brains. Put them into gear. I'll give you one more. That kind of threat. That's the, the stigma of your past. Many are battling with insecurity because of the stigma of their past. Past sins that everybody has known, the scandals, the setbacks, everything that has been advertised about you. And because of that, people have labeled you wrong. Do you realize that human beings by nature, they like to label people in order for them to feel okay. So somebody bleeds for 12 years and the person has been healed for over 2,000 years. Up to today, we still refer to her, the woman with the issue of blood. For heaven's sake, she got healed. But that is human nature. Doubting Thomas, he doubted only once. But today, we are still calling him. Meanwhile, you doubt more than him. Look at your doubting face that you are using to look at me. Listen, I don't care whatever you have been through. Listen, the blood of Jesus speaks. And it speaks louder and more powerful than anything that is trying to put you down. Anyone who is dragging your past into the present has dared to put the blood of Jesus Christ on open display. But I'm here to make an announcement that the blood of Jesus Christ has never lost its power. It makes the sinner, sinner whole. It drags us from the, the portals of addiction and shame. And it makes it. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Who can set me free, free again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Listen, come to the black soul stands of Calvary and let one just one drop of blood fall on your head and ladies and gentlemen that is true liberty for if we say we have no sin we deceive ourselves but if we name our sins it's faithful and it's just to forget all or forgive all our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness that is what he has done listen stop allowing people there he was my classmate you don't have any classmate your only classmate is yourself the day you came to Jesus Christ because if anyone be in Christ that person becomes a brand new creature all things are passed away and behold listen people bring those things up just to shut you up and just to tie you down and just to listen today I liberate you from the trauma of your past listen I don't care how many divorces you may have been through let Jesus Christ give you a brand new start you can begin again the story of Easter is a story of new beginnings am I talking to somebody it is telling you and I that we can begin again out of every chaos and every, every mistake God can help you that is why in this house our mission is that we restore people and we release their potential by connecting them to God connecting to God God is the gift of salvation. When you get saved, uh, he, he, that is what we call regeneration. He regains you. The old genes have no authority over you again. People may remember. They may accuse, but God forgets. We are too much in the ministry of accusation. Zechariah chapter 3. Verse number one, and he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel. And Satan, standing at his right hand to oppose, that word oppose the same accuse, was accusing him. And the Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord rebuke you, Satan. You see the manifestation of the Godhead here? Okay. That's, the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? That man is a fire brand. Now, the reason why Satan was opposing him, accusing him was that Joshua, the high priest, he was dressed in filthy garments. Standing, that's when you go to prayer. The first thing that happens is accusation. You beat your grandmother in 1932. Why are you going to pray to me? God won't listen. You know, you played the lottery and you missed it by one and you swore in traffic. <laughs> Somebody cut you off and you told them they were number one. <laughs> Let's go. And the Lord and spoke to me and said, the Lord said to those standing, he said, take away the filthy garments from him. And he said, I have removed your iniquity Amen. from you. 
and I will clothe you with rich robes. This is you and I. It doesn't matter that Joshua was in a mess. God said, I chose him and I'll deal with him. So let me give you in three minutes the keys to your freedom. Have you learned anything today? How you can be free. You remember I promised you at the beginning that I'll give you the prescription. How, the reason why Jesus was able to undress. And that is what I'm going to give to you. Give me John chapter 13. Let me give you, it was in plain sight. It was a pink elephant in the room. There are three things here that will help you become secure. Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands. He had come from God and was going to God. That is your answer. That was his, that is your answer. Number one, Jesus knew he had come from God. Number two, he knew what had been given to him. And number three, he knew what was going. In order to be secure, in order to be able to undress without insecurity, you have to internalize these three things about Jesus. Let's look. Number one, you must know where you came from. Jesus said, the Bible says he had come from his father. Please, settle this once and for all. Your parents may have told you you were not planned. God planned you. Amen. For you to bypass contraception and come here, God planned you. For everything that you are, ladies and gentlemen, let, let it sink in your spirit, in your mind. Because if you don't resolve this matter, you empower people to control you. That is why racists and bigots, they talk and people can't talk back. I remember one time, I, was, I think I was in the UK, some, I've forgotten the exact thing and Somebody was talking about, I think some archbishop, what about Africans, they were ignorant and superstitious. I think school, in Spurgeon's College. I was the only black face and I really like it when I'm like that. Because you step on my tail, you wouldn't die like the lion. I didn't talk in class. Then I lifted my hands and the, the, I think the whole years that I was there, I lifted up my hands about only two. And I looked, I said, yes, Frank, today you are going to, I said, yeah. I said, this is what the plan, and I said, where is the guy? I said, he hasn't met me yet. You can talk about Africans, but you haven't met me yet. A man was standing outside here. One day I came to the office, he was crying, and I asked him what he was looking for, and blah, blah, blah. He was in his elements, and he said he was from Alabama, and blah, blah, and he was telling me all his troubles. And he said, where do you come from? I said, where do you think I come from with my accent? And I said, gentlemen, one reason why I want you to stop crying and go out and fight the world and win is because you are looking at that. If you know where I have come from, to be able to come and build this, you'll be very guilty of yourself. Now get into your car and go and succeed. You don't know the disadvantage. Listen, I tell you, even when I'm preaching in English, it's a disadvantage. Because I don't think in English. I don't think in English. I think in my mother tongue. Then I have to translate it to English and speak it. So I'm doing twice the work you are doing. It's communication. I kid you not. I don't think in English. And the things I think in my mother tongue, if I spoke it. <laughs> you must know where you come from. Am I talking to somebody? Even Jesus had to tell, give me John 8 and 14. They were having an altercation. And Jesus says to the Pharisees, listen, the reason why, why are you so confident? Jesus said, if I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. For I know where I came from and where I'm going. But you do not know where I came from. Know where you came from. You came from God. You are not an accident. Your birth was never a mistake. Don't validate yourself, like I said, by what you do or by what you don't do. Don't validate yourself by what... Validate yourself about what God has made you. You bring God pleasure. Not because you sing or you preach or you serve or you give, but because of who you are. You are a child of God. Did you notice that in the temptation of Jesus on the Mount of Temptation, the first, the three-pronged attack, the first one that came was the battle against his identity? If you are the son of God, which means, do you really know who you are? If you are the son of God, if you are, you will never win the battle of life if you don't win the battle of your identity. You are God, God says you are. You are not what you have done. You may have done what they say you did, but you are not who they say you are. Build your self-image, your confidence on God's word. This is when you are confident and you know where you have come from. That it does, whether you lose your job or you haven't lost your job, whether people walk out on you or they don't walk out on you, you know I am a child of God. Yeah. Number two, know what you have. Know what you have. Know what you have. Know what it, because nobody came into this world with nothing. God made you with all the spe spe specs needed to fulfill your purpose. You are loaded with grace. 
Some people can sink themselves into a glorious destiny. Others can jump and do basketball hoops with destiny. If you put a golf club in my hands, it's only a $20 golf club. If you put that same golf club in the hands of Tiger Woods, it's a billion dollar industry. Am I talking to somebody? If you give me a basketball, it's just a basketball, $39.99 from Walmart. Take that same ball, put it in the hands of Michael Jordan. It's a whole ball game. Am I talking to somebody? You can give me new clothing, it's a fashion statement. Take that same clothing and put them on the shoulders of the Messiah from Galilee and somebody will touch it and have healing after 12 years of bleeding. There's something on the inside of you that the world needs. He loaded you. You are a possibility with a capital P. Don't look down on yourself. Don't be anxious about what somebody else has. You are loaded for something. Listen, you are some of you have a voice that must touch the world. Some of you have writings that must touch the world. Don't let the cemetery be happy because you carry the giftings that God gave to you to be buried. No. Listen, bring expression out of it. One day you will eat from your gift. Amen. Never believe that you have nothing. In fact, let me stop. Can you say to yourself, I have something? Or oh, you are not saying it like you mean it. Say like you mean it. Pastor, he looked at Moses. Who are doing? He was in. He he, he had no self confidence because from the lofty heights of the of the Egyptian palace, he's now looking after sheep. He thought he had nothing. And the Lord asked him, Moses, what do you have? He said, no, nothing except the, except except. I like that. Elisha said to the woman, What do you have? She said, I have nothing except. Listen, you have something. Somebody's lunch can be be a happy hour for five thousand people. Am I talking to somebody? Two loaves, two, uh, five loaves and two fish gave a party and there's something on the inside of you. Listen, in this room right now is enough power to change the whole world. Many years ago, I was reading, I was reading some things on business and things. And how many of you know hula hoops? You know the hoops that people, the person who brought, who invented it, they became multi-millionaires. Hula hoops, hula hoops, hula hoops, hula hoops, hula hoops, nonsense hoops. That's a gold mine. Listen, I wrote this one here. Let me read it to you and run. It is not the person who has the most who does the most. It is it's the one who knows how to use what they have who makes the most. So you must know where, that, where you are coming from, from God. You must know what you have. It should make you confident. And number three, know where you are going. In effect, one day you and I will report back to God. And we are going to give an account of what we did in this life. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. Look at it carefully. Look at it carefully. Second, it says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. They, that is not that judgment seat in the in the Greek is Bema. Is Bema. Is the reward seat of Christ. Where you're going to be rewarded. Is the reward seat of Christ. That's not the white throne judgment. This is Bema. That each one may receive the things done in the body. In the body, whilst you are alive. The things you are, you are doing whilst you are here in the body, whether good or bad. So whatever you and I are doing, people, this, this moment, people say, well, Papa, you are tired already. I'm thinking about this, what I do in my body. Because one day, these lips will fall silent in your grave. And you'll meet your master. You are going to meet him one day. One of the most deadliest, one of the deadliest things is unfulfilled potential. So David lamented with this lamentation of a soul and son Jonathan. And there are many things in the lament in the dread. He said the shield of Jonathan returned, the sword had returned not empty. No blood. You had a sword but it didn't come back with blood because there was no potential fulfilled. Your shield should have protected you but you died. Long before the archers of Philistia shot their bows and they killed Saul and his son Jonathan and Makishwa on the mountains of Gilboa they had already committed destiny suicide for Jonathan his destiny suicide was that he attached himself to somebody he had no business attaching himself to he himself has said to David that I know one day you'll be king and David also knew when he said to Abishai I can't kill him because when God wants to eliminate his servants he goes to war and doesn't come back so Jonathan, even though the man is your father, you knew. And many of you, the reason why you shortcut your destiny is that you have attached yourself to people. Don't let me go in there. I want to stop. Don't let me go in there. 
Can you, can you Jonathan, he loved his father and hated him at the same time. Jonathan should have known better. He said to David that I know one day you'll be king. And my greatest joy will be standing next door to you. So why are you going to war with someone whose hands God is not, who, God's hands are not on? Some of you, you, you are not too smart in the spirit. I see some of you, and one time in this house, the interval is here. I looked at that interval and I said, you see this one, two, three, four. Give them this. Uh, I gave dates. I said all of them will be fighting each other. She also said, how did you find out? Me. <laughs> Sometimes the best thing I can do for you is to get you to separate from somebody. Don't let allow all your insecurities to rob you from doing all that the Lord allowed. That is what, listen, don't let anybody offend you for you to walk out from the service that you are giving to God. No, listen, let me tell you something. If a general, we are going to war, and a general tells you, Pastor Ben, sit here and guard this gate. And somebody seated behind, let's say Dell, keeps insulting Pastor Ben. I don't like you. I don't like you. I don't like you. And Pastor Ben gets up and leaves. General is not going to put a pin and medal on Pastor Ben's chest because he moved out of here. You stay there and you fight the thing because that is why your master, that is why I love, I love, I love this man so much. I love, please, can you forgive me? I love this man so much. He goes to war and he holds his own death warrant. And David writes to Joab and gives it to the man and says, carry it, Uriah, carry it to Joab and give it. And in the letter, David is commanding Joab that set Uriah at the place where the battle is fiercest. Don't let me start leadership. And then withdraw from him. <laughs> Your leader can set you where the battle is fiercest. Withdraw without. Says that when you withdraw, he'll be struck down and die. I feel like preaching this morning, but please forgive me. When Uriah went home, the Bible says that the commander-in-chief, David himself, said, Uriah, go home and sleep with your wife. He said, I can't do that. So long as Joab, the commander, and the ark of God, and the armies of Israel are fighting, I can't do that. What a general, what a stalwart man. He refused to move out of where he had been placed because there was a battle fighting. How dare you just move out of a ministry? How dare you die? I don't like it, I'm offended, I'm gone. Really? You don't understand destiny. What is wrong with you? One day you will stand before God and my prayer is that when you meet Jesus on that pearly gate, he will shake your hands and say that I had a blast living in your body. My name is Franco Fosopia and my assignment is done. How was it? I hope you, have, you learned a few things. I hope you gave me some feedback and I hope from today you are going to be free to be yourself. You are not created to be controlled. You are not created to be, to be dominated. You were created to be yourself. So go ahead and live your life because Jesus is having a blast on the inside of you. Again, thank you for staying with me through this telecast. We're going to come back your way next week. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be amazing. God bless you, and I'll see you when I see you. Bye-bye.